Welcome back to Idealist. Today we are covering the greatest cars ever built that no one bought. Ideal cars, unlike the Aztec. And first on this list is the Lexus LFA. Power, prestige, and the eye-watering price tag from a company that has never built a supercar before. Well, unless you consider the 2000 GT a supercar, the LFA is the halo car that showed the world what Lexus and Yamaha could create with their relentless mm -hmm. pursuit of perfection. The outside looks like it was chiseled by Michelangelo, stabilized with an in-house carbon fiber reinforced plastic monocoque chassis. The engine is so good. It's like they stole Martha Stewart's favorite recipe for Snoop and then added a handful of Carolina Reapers. That's really hot. The secret sauce is the 553 horsepower, 4.8 liter V10 that revved so quickly, it needed a digital rev counter to keep up. It sounds like a freaking F1 car, except more refined and tuned by an audio engineer, which yes, Yamaha did fine tune the perfect pitch. This revolutionary new car from Toyota was in a class of none, priced at 375,000 when it was debuted in 2012. Unfortunately, for a third of the price, you could get cars like the Audi R8 V10 and the R35 GTR, which would overshadow the LFA's performance figures. The Lexus LFA was a sales failure, and most of the 500 built sat in dealer showrooms for years. But it was a smart investment for the people that did buy them, because now they're trading hands for 800K plus. Thankfully, this experiment created hype and developed new technology and styling language to flow across the brand which you can see in their design language even today. Mm, mm, mm. McLaren F1. Before Bugatti's Veyron came along with its 16 cylinder, four turbos and quad digits of horsepower, the OG McLaren F1 reigned as the fastest car in the world for a decade with a top speed of huh, 240 mile per hour in 1992. Who are you kidding? Now, if you were to take a masterclass on car building, you'd want to take it from this guy, Gordon Murray. He penned the groundbreaking design, tech, and record dominating performance that McLaren's first halo car would become. From the sidewalk, you'll see unforgettable classic supercar proportions, using lightweight materials like carbon and titanium to enhance its futuristic and exotic presence. Pop the ultra cool gold wing doors and you're greeted with, <laughs> what? Yeah three seats. The F1 featured a central driving position flanked by two passenger seats. This layout was designed to provide the driver with optimal visibility and control and allow two passengers to ride along for the ultimate thrill ride, which <laughs> was easily achieved thanks to a 627 horsepower V12 that needed literal gold plating in the engine bay to keep the heat down. Yeah, sounds cheap. Well, Considering it was the first production car to break the seven figures MSRP, cheap it was not. You could buy a Ferrari F50 or a Lamborghini Diablo SV or even a Porsche 959 for way less. And with the difference, buy a few of the next ideal car on this list. Now, McLaren set out to build 300 F1s, but could only muster up 106. Yes, a failed masterclass by Gordon, but a huge win for the small world of supercars. And let me tell you, investors agree. That original million dollar price tag now looks cheap as one just sold for 20 mil. Ford Focus RS. Ford's focus was set directly on the gap left by the incoming bloated Subaru WRX STI and the death of the Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution. Their weapon, the RS, a rally car for the road inspired by Jim Connors superstar Ken Block. <sighs> RIP, man. It was a hot hatch stuffed with a turbocharged 2.3 liter inline four power plant, a trick differential system, launch control, drift mode, and a ton of hype from the media and fans alike. So what killed the RS? Head gasket issues? Well, maybe, but not so much. It was shady dealer practices. Yes, they are the norm today. We're all used to them, but back in 2016, it was unheard of because this was a Ford performance product, dealers really felt like they had some sort of leverage to extract market correction fees, often upcharging tens of thousands of dollars for these high demand units. Even weirder yet was the way that dealers gave little consideration to younger drivers. 
nearly always denying test drives without signing purchase paperwork first. Soft sales at launch, well, they just never got better, and Ford killed the project just a couple of years later. Nowadays, they're one of the best cars to buy to make money while enjoying using the ideal car buying strategies, which I'll link right up here. So if you wanna learn more, check out our free workshop. It's great and free. And it's such a shame because a big manufacturer like Ford releases one of the coolest hot hatches on the planet in the history of, well, ever, and it gets absolutely eaten alive by a swarm of greedy salesmen. Not a good look, Ford, or dealerships. Do away with them. Dodge Viper. Ah, the fifth and final gen Viper. Modern lines that pay tribute to the car's muscular and aggressive heritage. Pop the reverse opening hood and you're greeted with the snake's bite. An impressive 8.4 liter V10 with 640 horses on deck. It is a special car that Trav would say represents the best of American performance and design. And yet, Dodge couldn't dodge the killer bite this snake would deliver. It came at a time when cars like the top of the line C6 ZR1 with similar performance wrapped in a more approachable, easier to live with package were on the market, which yes, the ZR1 costs 100K, but so did the base Viper. So which one do you choose? You buy a Viper for its standout V10 and sinister attitude, it's something different. And with Viper, you don't just blend in like you do with Corvette, going through a midlife crisis wearing your white New Balances. <sighs> True, but the nail in the coffin was the introduction of the Hellcat. It was the new kid on the block, or new kitten on the block, and it stole what little sizzle the Viper still had. The outgoing ACR model was the swan song for Petey the Snake, when the Dodge brothers secretly broke 13 track records all over the USA. Because, well, that's exactly what you do when you're failing at sales, right? Well, the Viper factory closed its doors in 2017, but fortunately, there's rumors that a new Viper is on the horizon. Unfortunately, if it happens, it's gonna be electric. And that snake don't bite the same. Acura NSX. The OG Honda NSX was the first everyday supercar, known for its great looks, reliable drivetrain, and elevated comfort. The second gen followed in its footsteps. It's sleek, low slung profile, wedge shaped front end, and aggressive styling give it a distinct and sporty look that is instantly recognizable. And midship lies a trick hybrid electric V6 twin turbo combo, good for 570 horse. It's essentially this baby Porsche 918, something extremely rare in its segment. Sounds like a full package, doesn't it? So let me ask you a question. You could buy a 911 Turbo, an Audi R8, a Nissan GTR, or an Acura NSX for the exact same price. How many of you are actually buying the Acura? Me, 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 me. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the greatest supercars Japan has ever produced. That uh, no one bought. Where they missed the mark was, well, by pricing it at 160K, where if it would have been closer to 100K MSRP, it would have done really well. Which, luckily, you can now pick a lightly used example for just over 100. Once they're sub 100, even used, that is a steal of a deal. So if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and go check out this Idealist video up here or what YouTube recommends you watch down here. I'm Brad, this is Ideal, and promise me one thing, keep living the ideal lifestyle.